Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Mike Duran. I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and today we're having a webinar on Syria, the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign, and the Syrian regime's use of chemical weapons. In early April, the Assad regime was found responsible for using chemical weapons on three, three times within a short period of time on the same village by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. That's the international group in The Hague that is responsible for overseeing the Chemical Weapons Convention, <coughs> the International Convention, um, Chemical Weapons Convention. The OPCW set up a special organization of independent uh, analysts to look into the, to the uh, use of chemical weapons in Syria. And for the first time, it found the Assad regime uh, guilty. Uh, in the past, the uh, OPCW has verified the use of chemical weapons, but it has avoided attribution to the uh, Assad regime. Because of the coronavirus crisis, uh, this report uh, hit the news and then kind of died, hasn't received a lot of attention, uh, but we here at Hudson thought it was important uh, to dig into it, to see what it means for our Syria policy um, and for, uh, the, uh, for, for Syria and for our Syria policy. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel here to discuss this issue. Uh, leading off the panel is Ambassador James Jeffrey, who is probably, I think certainly, the most experienced man in the State Department today. Ambassador Jeffrey has a long and distinguished career as a Foreign Service officer. Before he started that, he was a military officer fighting in Vietnam and serving in Germany. Uh, after he joined the Foreign Service, he rose over the decades to the rank, the coveted rank, the highest rank in the State Department, that of career ambassador. Along the way, he was ambassador to Albania, to Iraq, uh, and to Turkey, and he was also the deputy national security advisor in the George W. Bush administration. That's the hardest job in the government because you're not allowed to sleep and you're held responsible for everybody else's mistakes. Ambassador Jeffrey, hello. Uh, hi, Michael. Good to be here. Uh, all I'll say is I'm the oldest person in the State Department. I'm not so sure the rest apply to me, okay? Okay, well, you're very humble. It's one of the nice things about working with you. Um, after Ambassador Jeffrey, we have Das Thomas Danano. He runs the Arms Control Verification and Compliance Bureau in the State Department. This makes him the official in charge of missile defense, space policy, uh, and of course, chemical weapons. Before that, he was in uh, Homeland Security with responsibility for counterterrorism programs and national preparedness initiatives. Des Danano, hello. Uh, thanks, Mike. Great to be here. Great to have you. And last but not least, we have uh, David Follow the Money Asher. He is the, he is the senior fellow at the Hudson Institute with me. He is one of the most experienced people in the United States on using money and the tracking of money to take down terrorist networks. He has advised people at the highest levels of the government, including presidents directly, I know this from my own experience, uh, as well as the military and the Defense Intelligence Agency. David, hi, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, let me turn to you first. Could you just set the scene for us? Could you, let, could you tell us what's going on in Syria today What's U.S. policy? And frankly, are we winning or are we losing? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, first of all, the Syrian conflict has been going on for uh, over eight years now, since 2011. This is the most serious and dangerous conflict underway in the world today. Over half the population uh, has been driven by, from their homes by President Assad and his henchmen. That's almost 12 million people either internally displaced in areas that Assad doesn't control or in the case of 6 million refugees across the border. Uh, this is basically a war of Assad and his supporters, Russia and Iran, against much of the population of Syria. The uh, conflict has drawn in five outside armies, the Russian, the Iranian, uh, and for other reasons, the U.S., the Turkish, and while they don't always uh, admit it, the Israelis. 
uh, to conduct various operations in very close proximity. This makes it, uh, in another sense, the most dangerous conflict in the world today. We've also seen the rise of terrorist movements, either deliberate or inadvertent, because of the loss of control over the country, uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and particularly Daesh or ISIS, uh, as well as the use of chemical weapons, which we're going to talk about here today. Uh, the U.S. position, which is supported by most of the international community, is to find a political solution to this conflict under UN Resolution 2254, which calls for elections and a UN-run uh, new constitutional process. Uh, we support that fully. We also want to see the Iranian and all Iranian uh, commanded forces out as part of any peace uh, settlement. And of course, we want to see the enduring defeat of Daesh. Uh, we approach this by first of all, mobilizing the uh, international community, working closely with Iran, uh, I'm sorry, working closely with the UN, and uh, continuing uh, a policy of pressure, uh, mainly economic and diplomatic, to isolate this regime and to sanction uh, the major oligarchs and others who are supporting Assad. We believe that we're having considerable uh, success. Uh, uh, another part of this whole diplomatic campaign, however, is what we call uh, accountability, holding Assad responsible for uh, his deliberate attacks on no-go sites that the UN has passed through the Russians to the Assad regime, hospitals and such, that Assad then deliberately attacks. Uh, not allowing humanitarian deliveries across lines. Secretary General Guterres just spoke out formally on this. And today, uh, his use of chemical weapons, uh, he has done this repeatedly. As you know, the United States is uh, uh, taking a very tough position on this in this administration. We've had two uh, strikes, second uh, joined by British and uh, uh, French uh, military forces, and we're prepared to act again uh, if we see Assad moving towards uh, the use of chemical weapons. We certainly think that he is uh, 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 keeping that option open, but I'll turn it over to Tom now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dastanano, what, what can you tell us about this uh, report that came out in early April? How significant is it? Um, and how can the United States uh, use it uh, to, uh, to, to blunt the actions of the Syrians and the Russians? Yeah, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, uh, and uh, thank you and uh, welcome to my uh, friend and colleague, Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, uh, your introduction doesn't quite do it justice, but uh, he's great to have on our side. And um, let me just run through quickly what I, I think why the uh, OPCW report is important. Um, and um, some of the work that has been done uh, at the OPCW by Director General Arias and uh, Ambassador Onyate, who ran the double IT report. I, I would say just before I wanted to make a few remarks about the report, uh, this is some of the worst acronyms you'll ever see, uh, even for all my uh, colleagues and friends that have worked in the Pentagon, so just bear with me. Um, but most importantly about the double IT report is that it is uh, it, it's impartiality and it's technical professionalism in the level of detail which Ambassador Arias and uh, Onyate and, uh, uh, took to run through it. Uh, so some of its key conclusions, uh, I think, are worthy for our discussion here today. Uh, most importantly, again, this was last month at IIT. Um, the IIT is charged with uh, identifying the perpetrators, not whether or not a, an attack took place. Uh, that is another mechanism uh, called the uh, fact-finding mission. So uh, the IIT's report actually identifies uh, the perpetrators, and in this uh, case, has identified the Assad regime as responsible uh, for those um, attacks in, um, in March of 2017. Um, they were based on a nine-month investigation uh, that included... Uh, interviews with, uh, with eyewitnesses. Uh, it conducted re uh, reviews of the uh, testimony. Uh, it reviewed uh, potential symptoms, chemical analysis that were taken on site. Uh, it anal analyzed the, uh, the fragments of the ammunition of the ordinance that was used in question. It reviewed the satellite imagery. It reviewed site plans. Uh, so the level of detail when you read the report, and if folks are interested enough to join this discussion, um, it might be a worthwhile read. It's not 500 pages, it's maybe 50 pages, and it's incredibly uh, detailed. 
Um, another point I'd like to make about uh, the, the, the impartiality of the report that I think is critical is that the alternative scenarios that Ambassador Onyate uh, went through, that they looked at every plausible alternative scenario um, to uh, whether or not uh, uh, the Assad regime was responsible for these attacks. And again, when you read the report, you'll see that the level of detail and the time that they took to go through these alternative scenarios that they were staged and everything that you see coming from the propaganda machine in, in uh, Russia and Syria now, it, uh, it tells you that um, this uh, notion of impartiality was taken extremely seriously. And um, I can tell you, I think the results are well worth the wait. It's, there's some frustration sometimes as the, the, uh, the international machinery of multilateral organizations uh, to take time to work through these, this type of work, but the results speak for themselves. Again, an incredible effort. And um, just one last comment, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to you, is why the OPCW is important is that it's not a report from the United States. It's not a report by the United States and its allies. The OPCW uh, is an international organization. We contribute like everyone else. Everyone has a voice. Uh, everyone has a vote. And uh, so for the OPCW to produce such a thing, again, speaks very loudly. And uh, again, I would encourage you uh, to actually read the report. You can download it from the OPCW website um, to look, uh, again, determine, make your own conclusions and uh, as to the level of professionalism and the credibility of the report. So uh, I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Uh, again, thank you for having me here. I look forward to our discussion. No, thank you. And let, let's now move the, to, uh, to David Asher. Uh, David, as a, as a veteran of the fight uh, to use um, international law and, uh, and terrorist finance against regimes like uh, the Assad regime, what's the significance from, in your mind of this report? Well, the significance is uh, that, yet again, the Assad regime, uh, like uh, father, like son, is engaged in uh, the development uh, the pursuit, the development, and the deployment of weapons of mass destruction. This has been going on for over 25 years. Uh, the history that I was most intimately involved in trying to uh, stop during the Bush administration was uh, with the North Korean government. Uh, in, uh, from 2002 to 2007, the Assad regime pursued a nuclear weapons program in Syria, centered around a facility called al Kabar. Uh, a little money, mini Yongbyon nuclear reactor like you see in, outside of uh, Pyongyang, North Korea, <laughs> on the Euphrates River. Uh, and uh, had the Israeli Air Force not took in, taken out that facility on September 4th and uh, 5th of uh, 2007, Assad would have had a nuclear weapons program. Um, the fact that the Assad regime pursued a nuclear weapons program, most likely as the senior official in charge of this, I will say, in my mind, almost undoubtedly in partnership with the government of Iran, I don't think the Assad regime had the money otherwise to afford it, uh, with the support of the North Koreans, is a very bad harbinger of what could be happening right now, as pointed out in the OPCW report. I think we just scratched the surface of a very uh, evil access uh, uh, relationship between uh, North Korea, uh, Iran, in Syria and Hezbollah, which cannot be under, understated, especially if you're looking at the finances, um, huge amount of money is moving through Lebanon right now and has. So th this is nothing new. It just gets worse and worse. And what's great is the OPCW did an objective fact-finding effort to uh, unveil it. So it's, it's nothing new, but uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, they, it's nothing new in the sense that we knew this all along, but now we have an international organization, and as, as Daz Danano says, one that is um, uh, independent and impartial, uh, that has identified the Assad regime as a perpetrator, and also a, a report that points to the complicity of the Russians in, 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 in all of this. Now, we've been, we've been hearing a lot of reports lately about tensions between the Russians and the Syrians. Is, are, can we believe these reports? And, and does the OPCW finding um, give us a tool to drive a wedge between Moscow and, and the Assad regime? One, we believe these reports are accurate. We have talked to the Russians at various uh, levels over the past year. Uh, the Russians are not happy with Assad. The problem is they do not see an alternative. The Russians have key interests in Syria. One is maintaining their bases. Uh, 
one they've had for a long time, one they got as part of the deal with him, and as well as certain other economic activities and investments that the Russians have made. That's their basic goal. Uh, but in addition, uh, they see Syria as an example of effective, uh, not quite little green men, but little green men plus. That is a limited military commitment that uh, brings them significant strategic success. And they've been fairly uh, successful, at least militarily. The problem is they don't have a political way out because of the problems with Assad. Our job is to uh, present them through the UN and our support for the UN with a way forward, but that requires them distancing themselves to some degree from Assad and from the Iranians. That's where uh, issues like uh, the use of chemical weapons were, as you know, in 2013, uh, the Obama administration and the Russians at the highest levels uh, came to an agreement that was supposed to eliminate all chemical weapons. Well, not only are they not uh, uh, being eliminated, they're being used. So they were used in 2017. We saw one case of them being used uh, in the spring of uh, last year in 2019, as Secretary Pompeo laid out in New York in September. So uh, we do try to stress to the Russians that as long as they have an ally like Assad, they're not going to get the international community to stomach him to support uh, a diplomatic reconciliation, to support reconstruction assistance, so that they are allied and uh, hooked up with a cadaver. And uh, they realize that that's not a good way forward. Uh, and all the rest is simply uh, hard negotiations with them to try to find a way forward, which is what we're doing now. Now, we're, we're in an election era. And w when I talk to conservative um, audiences, I, I often hear people saying, what the hell are we doing there anyway? Like, like why, don't we just, why don't we just leave it, leave it all behind? Why, why should, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, why should Americans care about this issue, Syria? That's a very long uh, in complicated question, uh, Michael. It's a question of uh, what's America's role in the world. As somebody who's been involved in two of our bigger and I think uh, less successful ventures, Vietnam and Iraq, I have a lot of sympathy with the American people. And that's why I point to things like our presence in Syria or our presence in Iraq today, where it's just a few hundred or a few thousand Americans with a very large international contingent of some 20 or 30 countries who have joined us in Iraq and a few who support us in Syria. Uh, extremely low casualties, extremely low cost, and very significant strategic gain. Do the American people want to have this region, the Middle East, and tomorrow the United States attacked with chemical weapons? Do they want to see terrorism run uh, unchecked through the region. We've already seen what that does to us. Do they want to see refugees flows from Syria uh, and other places undermine our trading and strategic allies in Europe, which we saw in 2015? I could go on and on. There's lots of reasons why this matters to us, even oil. Right now, it's in surplus around the world. Uh, it'll probably always be in surplus in the United States, but our trading partners from uh, Japan to Europe need oil that can only come in that quantity from one place, that's the Middle East. So for all of those reasons, we need to be there. We need to be there smart. My argument is what we're doing in Syria right now and in Iraq is smart. Thank you, that's very clear. Des Donano, when you, when you look at this report, you made it clear that, uh, that, the, um, that one of the values of the report is that it undercuts the Russian propaganda. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I've been following this issue for years now. Um, again, when I talk to audiences, it always surprises me um, how many people, I'm talking about Americans, are, are willing to believe uh, that, uh, that these chemical weapons um, uh, attacks in Syria are done uh, by some, uh, um, you know, by ISIS or by, uh, by Turkey. Uh, I hear all kinds of things other than, um, uh, other than the Assad regime. Um, and as you mentioned, this report does a very good job of, um, of, uh, of answering all of, those, uh, all of those false claims. How can we use it now to our, to our advantage? How can we really put it to work other than simply pointing to it? Uh, a great question, uh, Michael. Uh, look, what um, I guess what you what you learn in these multilateral organizations in, uh, in the Hague or the UN or in Geneva 
is that um, countries hate being called out. Um, I mean, there is, a, there is a bit of a so what. So you have a report, so what, what does that mean? Um, the, the level of effort that uh, uh, the Russians or the Syrians and their, uh, their cabal of, uh, uh, of friends will take uh, to deny, uh, to save face in these international organizations is, is really astonishing. So it tells you, tells us that, uh, that what we're doing is effective. And again, back, back to that report that, that, that you mentioned, uh, all of these conspiracy theories, if you would, were exhaustively uh, uh, um, run through recreating scenarios to actually say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll look at your claims. Uh, and, when, and when you read that, to me, it just shows that, uh, again, the level of effort that they took to be impartial. And uh, um, it, it tells me that we're being effective uh, the louder they, they push back. And uh, again, you don't see this all the time uh, necessarily, uh, but on the ground in The Hague, uh, delegations there. We've got a great ambassador at the OPCW, Ambassador uh, Ken Ward. Uh, you really see diplomatic uh, efforts paying off. So you think even the Russians, uh, uh, even the Russians can be embarrassed? Uh, yeah, look, I've, uh, again, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey could probably tell you more, more than I, I could, but my interactions with them, they can't even look you in the eye across the table. Um, their instructions coming from very high levels and uh, their diplomats, uh, again, can't even look you in the eye. They know full well that there's a red line that was crossed, the chemical weapons use. Uh, I mean, you know, we get so used to these atrocities and it's becoming seemingly normalized in our, you know, in our news cycles. Uh, when you actually read the report, uh, you, know, um, you know, they dropped a, a chlorine bomb on a hospital. Right. I mean, this is just, the level of atrocity is astonishing. Now, and, correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. This was, the, the, the Russians passed intelligence to the Syrians about the exact location of the, uh, of the hospital, and then the Syrians dropped the bomb on the, on the yeah, hospital. Is and, that right? And I would point out that the hospital was already underground. Uh, that was the only way that they could actually treat some of the, uh, some of the casualties of the war. So an already struggling health infrastructure, barely functioning, uh, and they dropped a, a chlorine bomb on it. So again, the, 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 the levels to which the Syrians and their, uh, and their uh, backers, the Russians will, uh, will go, seem to know no bounds. And, uh, um, but I think our efforts are, are, are being effective on, on calling them out. Is it, is it realistic for us to, um, to fear that the Syrians might pass these weapons to uh, non-state actors like Hezbollah or sub-state actors? Uh, maybe I'll just respond quickly. Uh, absolutely, the, uh, the maintaining of an in infrastructure to uh, procure, acquire uh, uh, you know, logistics to deploy uh, such weapons it has to be uh, troubling for uh, everybody involved in chemical weapons. Um, again, this is these are these are now active, and uh, again, as we see, they're 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 usable. So uh, very troubling. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, Michael, this has got the Israelis particularly concerned. Uh, the mounting evidence of chemical weapons reconstitution and willingness to use it. Uh, and the Syrians pass all kinds of weapons on to Hezbollah. I don't see them stopping at chemical weapons. And so this has got to be a, it, it's a concern to the Israelis, Ambassador Jeffrey, but uh, this, is a, this is a proliferation concern uh, that the United States has to take very seriously. I would think so. And I think most Americans uh, uh, share our concern about chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, biological weapons. Do you, in, in, your, in your travels abroad and your discussion with diplomats in Europe uh, and, um, and elsewhere, do you, do you sense a, um, a similar uh, uh, sense of gravity about this issue? The problem, Michael, is there are so many indictments against the Assad regime, indictments that uh, particularly resonate among our European uh, partners. Uh, violation of UN norms, uh, human rights abuses, on and on, uh, up to use of chemical weapons, a weaponizing of refugees, which the Europeans have seen, uh, that it's hard to 
uh, separate out concern about one of the awful things the Assad regime does from all of the other things. What we do is we measure what the Europeans are doing. And what mm. they're doing is they're holding the line against reconstruction assistance or diplomatic recognition. They are passing uh, packages of sanctions after package of sanctions. They just did one about a month and a half ago before uh, uh, the coronavirus hit. And uh, there are partners in this uh, maximum pressure campaign. And we believe that they'll stay with us in large measure because they understand uh, how terrible this guy is across the board. He stops at nothing. You know, a few years ago, uh, I was involved uh, in the National Security Council in his attempt to get uh, a nuclear weapon through assistance from North Korea. At the very last moment, uh, our, our friends, the Israelis, took care of that uh, threat to uh, the region and to the world. But uh, this guy just keeps on delivering threat after threat. So the, uh, if I read you correctly, uh, our strategy it, um, is hinge, hinges on the fact that what the Russians want is for the Europeans to come in and to pay for, for reconstruction of Syria, because the Syrian regime can't pay for it, uh, and Russia can't pay for it. Um, the Chinese, I presume, are not going to come in and pay for it. So what they want to do is just kind of get us used to the fact that the Assad regime behaves like this and then uh, slowly come in and start paying for reconstruction while they benefit, while they uh, reap the strategic rewards. And what we're doing, if I read you correctly, is that we're denying them that money that they covet. Is that the, is that the essence of it? To, to some degree, and that's why we don't have quite as much uh, traction with the Russians with all these terrible things. Otherwise, uh, there's an old saying, if you owe a bank a thousand dollars, the bank owns you. If you own a bank a billion dollars, you own the bank. Uh, the Russians are basically uh, saying, this guy is so awful. This guy is so much of a threat to you. Look at the terrorist uh, attacks in 2015 and 16. Look at the refugee waves the same year. It's just, this is the gift that just keeps on giving terrible things unless you get behind us, Russia, to save Assad by making him, we don't know what, uh, uh, fat and happy. Uh, there is no real answer to what the Russians want other than reconstruction money to flow from international organizations, Europe, the Arab world, and America, and for everybody to recognize Assad as the uh, leader of Syria. That's not going to happen. Uh, you do you see any do you see any sign there's so much concern these days about the chinese do you see any sign that the chinese are taking an interest in syria are they are they possibly uh willing to fund anything in syria uh, or is it is it a concern at all that we should have um the issue of china in the middle east is a bigger uh and complex issue because normally we see for example in u.n votes the chinese will line up uh loyally behind the russians but they have different interests in the Middle East than the Russians do. Uh, they obviously want low oil prices, which they have right now, but generally speaking, uh, uh, tension and conflict in the Middle East sends oil prices up. That's not a problem for Russia. In fact, it's a good thing. It's one of the difficulties we have with Russia in the Middle East. Uh, but for the Chinese, it is a problem. They also are not willing to either uh, trust the Russians to run the Middle East, or enter themselves. So therefore, their position has relatively been relatively benevolent towards the American security system in the Middle East over the past decade and a half, where they've challenged us in other areas. Uh, when that will change, as it probably will, I don't know. But for the moment, uh, their interests are strategic stability, and in a way that aligns with us. And secondly, uh, flow of oil, that's also fine with us. Uh, thirdly, if uh, they're going to do something in Syria, they're going to make a profit. And as there's no profit to make in Syria right now, <laughs> you're just not there. Right. Uh, David, back to you. Um, when, when you're looking at these uh, economic problems that the Assad regime and Hezbollah are, are, are having, um, do, you, do you see any way to, uh, um, to, to use these problems in a more strategic fashion? Yeah, I, I actually think that we're on the verge, if we, if we wish to pursue an opportunity uh, that's presenting itself to actually sort of obliterate the financial foundations of both the Assad regime, and I would argue in many respects that of Lebanese Hezbollah as well. Um, 
the Iranians are already uh, suffering a huge economic blow through uh, declining oil revenue, and so they can't bail, bail either of them out, nor can Russia. So the macroeconomic factors are all uh, weighing negatively against uh, Assad and his henchmen and uh, Hezbollah. But what makes them um, further vulnerable is that they have become increasingly reliant on uh, illicit sources of income. They've been involved in criminal activity as long as time has existed. But uh, it just got more and more conspicuous. You see uh, particularly the activities of a man named Rami Makhlouf, who's the brother-in-law of Assad, uh, the, the Syrian leader, who's been also the financial czar of the regime. Uh, he's got himself in all sorts of rackets, including uh, Captagon, which is a variant of methamphetamine smuggling. Um, Long-term partnership with the government of Venezuela, actually, uh, which comes out in the recent indictments against the Nicolas Maduro regime, or former regime, uh, in cocaine trafficking, money laundering. Uh, Hezbollah played a major role and plays a major role in that on the ground. In Europe, there have actually been over 50 tons of cocaine seized by European authorities in the last 36 months tied to the Iran, Hezbollah, Syria network. Um, and, and these have been targeted and coordinated by US law enforcement. Uh, I've seen no press on this. It's not secret. You can, there's been articles about the seizures, but no one's actually put together the pieces. If we had a campaign of actions to unseat the finances of the Assad regime, much like the one we did against Slobodan Milosevic back in 97, 98, that was com complemented by a special operations campaign from the air, um, uh, when, back in 97, 98, we had something called Operation Matrix, which involved uh, Joint Special Operations Command, notably in a leadership role, uh, taking out the factories and the financial fa facilitators and the, uh, the, the administrative uh, hubs uh, and, and leaders for uh, the Milosevic regime, literally killing them or wiping those facilities out. And then the Treasury Department went with the State Department's help into Cyprus and Liechtenstein and Luxembourg and other locations where the money of Milosevic was hidden and told the governments there, either freeze it or we're going to cut you off in the U.S. Uh, very similar strategy could be implemented against uh, the regime of uh, Assad. Um, and I think that we could target Hezbollah concurrently uh, for their cocaine trafficking, money laundering, uh, using the uh, RICO indictment, something that's been never been applied by the Department of Justice against terrorists, even though it's a, a predicate offense uh, terrorism is a predicate offense for RICO. So, you know, to me, the, 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 it's time for us to not just look at this problem, and I'm not saying the ambassador's looking at it, he's going at it full bore, but I'm saying as Americans, these, this, is a, this is a zone of conflict that ultimately could be the site of much more plausibly of a future 9-11. When I came back to state in 2014, 2015, 2015 to build the economic campaign against the Islamic State, Syria was disproportionately a central player in that. Um, and uh, we, we can't ignore that, 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 that Syria is much more interconnected and much more of a geographical threat uh, uh, to our national security interests. It's not just some place in the Middle East that we've forgotten about. It's, 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 it's actually existential. But we do have the means to bring uh, uh, this regime under tremendous pressure. And what we need to do is get organized. It, it's very odd because it's, 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 it's existential, as you say, or it's interconnected with all of these larger national security issues. But the place itself, we have, very, we have no interest in it. I mean, there's no, it's, there's no, we have no major economic interests. Right? The, the Assad regime does not pose a direct threat to the United States and so on. But it's at the crossroads of all these other, other issues. So it's hard to get the level of commitment right. Um, because it, because to a lot of people, it just doesn't seem to make to, to make sense. Sure, uh, sorry, Michael, if, if I may intervene there, that's why we are pursuing what we think is a smart policy, a very limited American military presence for a very specific goal uh, to go after ISIS, uh, supporting uh, military operations of other countries uh, in various ways, Turkey, Israel, and focusing on economic and diplomatic uh, pressure. Uh, our military presence, uh, while small, is important to this whole overall calculation. So uh, we urge uh, the Congress, the American people, uh, the president to keep these forces on. But again, this isn't Afghanistan, this isn't Vietnam, this isn't uh, 
uh, a quagmire. Uh, my job is to make it a quagmire for the Russians. <laughs> and if I, and Michael, if I could just jump in real quick. Yeah. Economically, the ambassador has a tremendous tool that's about to come online called the Caesar Act. Um, uh, I can't tell you why it's called the Caesar Act, but it has something to do with the central bank of uh, Syria uh, a, a, as a money laundering uh, entity, which it certainly is. Um, but it's going to allow uh, secondary sanctions like we had with these so-called Sasada sanctions against the Iranians several years ago. Anybody who's touching the hand of a Syrian that's involved in anything uh, 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 bad from the standpoint of U.S. law is going to be sanctionable. So the ambassador has got a good team he's brought together. He's actually got real expertise, including the, the fellow who drafted the Caesar Law uh, for Representative Engel on the Hill. Um, the, the, you know, working, working over at state, uh, a, a Republican fellow and uh, very knowledgeable. They, I mean, there's a way to do this. And if we can bring together the forces of law enforcement, not, not just uh, U.S. law enforcement and European law enforcement, but actually international law, I would love to see, uh, you know, Assad tried as a war criminal at the, at the Hague. I've never been a big believer in that personally, but if there's ever a guy who deserved it, it's that <laughs> What? Yeah, I, I agree. Having uh, dealt with Milosevic in earlier days, uh, Assad uh, can make a, a better case for being a, a subject of the Hague than Milosevic. Uh, Caesar is the code name of a Syrian government defector who smuggled out uh, tens of thousands of pictures of Assad opponents being tortured and uh, killed in Assad's prisons. That's uh, where it got its name. Ambassador Jeffrey, um, if, I, if I could go back to your point about um, the smart use of force by the United States in, in, in Syria. I, I, I strongly agree with you, and I, I want to put to you a kind of little pet theory of mine um, and get your reaction to it. And, and uh, feel free to shoot it down if you disagree with it. Um, I, I, I think that Turkey can be of great benefit to us in Syria, and I think that the that the latest round of fighting in Idlib, uh, where the Turks killed a large number—I don't know the exact number—a large number of Iranian and Iranian and Hezbollah operatives, um, shows that it, that Turkey can be uh, part of, or at least be comfortable with, a U.S. counter Iran strategy and counter Russia strategy. In, uh, in the Middle East in general, and particularly in Syria. Now, Turkey is always going to have uh, more interaction with Iran than a lot of other countries in the, in the region. Um, they're not going to be as hostile to Iran as, say, Israel or Saudi Arabia, but they can, they, can, they can sit comfortably with a U.S. strategy, provided we look after, we, we are attentive to Turkish strategic, uh, strategic needs. Um, there's nobody, I think, in the government that understands U.S.-Turkish relations better than you. Better than you. Um, do you agree with my with with, with my little theory, or, uh, or 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 are you among those who think that um, uh, that uh, really we we can never come to an agreement with the Turks on this question? No, I'm a, uh, a full bore supporter of coordination and cooperation with the Turks on Syria as well as on certain other things. And by and large, uh, we do do that. Uh, we uh, share with them uh, an interest in ensuring that Idlib does not fall to Assad's forces. Uh, we work with them closely on the Constitutional Committee and on a political solution. Our uh, end goal for Syria is very similar to theirs. Uh, and also on Iran, while Turkey doesn't fear, and I won't say fear, Turkey does not see Iran uh, targeting Turkey per se. Turkey has long, this goes back to the Ottoman Empire, seen uh, Iran or Persia as a rival, as a threat on its border. Uh, I've heard this from President Erdogan twice personally, and I know it's uh, uh, deeply uh, ingrained in the Turkish uh, foreign policy uh, DNA that Iran is not a friendly power. All good. There are four things you have to consider. One, uh, the issue of our presence in the Northeast, working with uh, local Kurdish and Arab uh, partners. Uh, the Kurds have ties to, or had ties to the PKK. That's a real concern for Turkey. We saw the incursion. Secondly, uh, Turkey has a very 
complicated relationship with Russia. They're not friends, but they're mutually dependent on each other. Turkey is very reluctant to sever those ties, thus tries to balance us and the Russians. <coughs> that often doesn't work out. Uh, thirdly, we have a specific problem with their purchase of uh, the S-400 systems. And finally, Turkey, for various reasons, be it human rights, be it various lobbies, <coughs> is a hard sell in Washington. Are, are you, um, are, are you uh, optimistic about the direction of U.S.-Turkish relations? And they, we have these outstanding issues that you mentioned. Are you seeing, uh, are you seeing movement forward on them, or, uh, or is it still hard going? Uh, the S-400 is a huge issue. And I first got involved in Turkish affairs in the aftermath of the Cyprus intervention and the embargo. So I know how bad relations can be. But the S-400 is an extremely uh, complicated issue because it goes to the biggest defense investment the United States and its allies have made since World War II, which is the F-35 fighter, and the Turkish uh, action, which undercuts the capabilities of that fighter. So therefore, from our standpoint, we have no give. From the Turkish standpoint, it's a question of sovereignty. Why can't they buy weapons from whoever they want to buy weapons uh, from, particularly as the United States has a long history going back to the uh, weapons embargo of suddenly from uh, uh, yesterday to tomorrow, turning off uh, sales of weapons and uh, replacement parts and everything else without a good uh, uh, deliver of weapon systems from the Turkish standpoint. So both sides are locked in on that. That's the biggest problem. Beyond that, we basically get along fairly well with Turkey on most of the issues from Libya uh, to NATO to the Caucasus, Black Sea area, and including Syria and Iraq. Thanks. Dast, uh, Dastanano, when, when you look at uh, um, the current situation, the OPCW report, and uh, um, everything else that uh, our colleagues have been talking about, what are the next steps that you want to see the United States take in order to ratchet up the pressure on, uh, on Assad and the Russians? Uh, thanks, Mike, for the question. Um, I think uh, uh, David Asher began to hit on it, um, and um, at least where I come from in the in the counter WMD world, um, not only do we need to uh, publicly and diplomatically uh, uh, get engage, uh, engage and expose, uh, but we also need to dismantle. And this gets to um, complex finance. Uh, uh, arrangements, as, as David points out, uh, dismantle the supply chain um, and uh, render Syrian chemical weapons uh, program uh, a thing of uh, the last century, that to uh, eliminate it entirely. Um, so uh, I think there's ways to do that. Again, as David points out, uh, through, uh, through, through other means, and, and we're approaching it that way. Um, and, uh, and where necessary uh, military uh, pressure, um, as we've seen. So all options remain on the table. And uh, the diplomatic piece that uh, I'm engaged with on day to day is very much a part of, uh, part of that. But dismantling the chemical infrastructure is a, uh, an absolute imperative. Thanks. Um, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, on this question of dismantling and use of military force, of course, we do have an actor in the, um, in the Syria conflict who is using military force uh, for that purpose. I mean, the, I speak of the Israelis. Um, and the Israeli, Israelis want to see no Iranian strategic weaponry in, the, um, uh, in Syria. Uh, we've heard reports lately uh, that, uh, that, the Syria, that the Iranians may be withdrawing from Syria. Uh, I saw last week in a statement you uh, seem to pour a little bit of cold water um, on on that theory, uh, but nonetheless, it seems to me that the or uh, on those reports, nonetheless, it seems to me that the, the the Iranians are in a weakened position in in Syria as a result of Israeli actions and as a result of American policy. Um, is that the way you see it? And what what do you uh, what would you recommend as next steps to to, to put greater pressure on the Iranians with regard to these weapon systems? Um, first of all, uh, with total U.S. diplomatic support and other support that I won't go into, uh, the Israelis have carried out a very effective uh, military and diplomatic and essentially all elements of government campaign against Iranian uh, and Hezbollah strategic weapon systems in Syria. Uh, 
and that's having a real impact on the Iranians. Uh, secondly, uh, the Iranians are uh, all in on an Assad military victory. He suffered a huge reverse in the Idlib uh, battle back two months ago. Uh, that's another blow to the Iranians. We have seen also the Iranians uh, pulling in uh, some of their outlying activities and uh, uh, such in Syria because of, frankly, uh, financial problems that David mentioned in terms of the huge success of uh, the Trump administration sanctions policies against Iran. It's having a real effect in Syria. Uh, we do see some withdrawal of Iranian uh, uh, commanded forces. Uh, some of that is tactical because uh, they are not fighting right now, but it also reflects uh, a lack of money. Therefore, uh, my recipe is more of the same. Uh, use the Caesar bill when it comes out, maintain our military pressure, uh, which, as I said, is designed to uh, defeat ISIS, but it also uh, denies significant terrain and uh, resources, as the president is uh, want to say, the uh, oil fields of the Northeast. Uh, support the Israelis, support the Turks, uh, and work with the Arab world and Europe to ensure that nobody uh, uh, goes wobbly, as Margaret Thatcher once famously said, on uh, sanctions, on economic uh, uh, pressure and on uh, no diplomatic recognition. That's what we're doing. It seems to be slowly but surely having an effect. Do you do you see um, uh, Israeli and Turkish policies as um, uh, as um, compatible in Syria? Uh, they share many of the same goals. The problem is uh, this is probably the fifth reason why uh, there are limits to uh, how closely we can coordinate with Turkey. Uh, Turkey has. Uh, very difficult relations. And this is something quite new from uh, my time in Turkey. Turkey has very difficult relations with all of the Arab countries except Qatar, uh, all of the important ones except Qatar, uh, obviously not particularly good ones with Iran, and importantly, no longer good relations with Israel. That limits the ability of countries to uh, uh, cooperate with uh, Ankara to the extent it is done, it is done indirectly through their cooperating with us. Turkey cooperates with us, and we have uh, you know the added burden of trying to uh, keep everybody aligned. That's just that's that's. Uh, I would go back um, to to your original um, defense of why we need to be involved in a place like Syria. We have this. Um, indispensable coordinating role to play. Nobody in the region gets along with each other, uh, but a lot of them can get along with us. And so we can be kind of a shock absorber, um, assigning roles and missions, or at least getting, uh, playing, running interference so that their hostilities with each other don't get in the way of the really big questions. Would you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. And you'll read often, uh, uh, particularly in this administration, uh, in the media, uh, attacks on uh, uh, how we've lost our uh, ability to lead. Every president takes a different approach to the question of American leadership. This president has taken his approach. He's uh, 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 not shy about making it clear, but day in, day out on security issues all over Europe and all over the Middle East, uh, we remain the indispensable country, not only because of our power, but because of our contacts. And it begins with the president who has good relations with most everybody, including Erdogan, including Putin, uh, including all of the Arab leaders and most of the Europeans. They just won't admit it, but uh, uh, they're on the phone with them all the time. Uh, that's the reality. And it's the reality, frankly, with any president. It's just uh, the way it works. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Da so, so D David, uh, we're going to get the Caesar bill soon. This is going to give new tools. Um, let me put to you the question I asked uh, Das Danano. What are the steps that you would like to see, the immediate steps, uh, to turn this into a more, uh, uh, into an effective uh, uh, strategic tool? Well, I think that to me, the most important thing is to scare, coerce, uh, deter, dissuade those in the international financial system that are providing safe harbor, not just to um, the procurement architecture uh, of support for the Assad regime's WMB programs. That's a matter of course, we'd want to target that. But I want to go after Assad's personal piggy bank. I want to find his money. 
I've done this uh, personally five or six times. I know it's possible. Whether I can do it, the hope the State Department can do it, and we'll support them at the Hudson Institute. But um, you know, there's a certain art and a certain science to doing this. Uh, the the we we've, we've developed, a, and I I'm proud to have been part of the financial intelligence revolution. The U.S. government starting 25 years ago. Um, we have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of things we've declared publicly over the years uh, uh, to track terrorism finances. This is a state sponsor, uh, a terror partner of terror states. Um, and um, every tool that we can imagine uh, uh, out there is, is available. It's a question of task organization and building a campaign. That's one thing I learned when I came in in a desperate hour with John Allen to help um, as a civilian to help build the economic war campaign. Uh, ultimately General McFarland as well against the Islamic State. I mean, we had hundreds of people supporting us in the government and very few people could tell us what to do. They couldn't give us information, but the information existed. So what I've been impressed by from afar looking at what Ambassador Jeffries put together, he's put together a team of women and men who are first rate, who know their targets. They've, they've effectively sanctioned almost every major aspect of the SSRC, which is the WMD program. Of, of Syria, there are ancillary elements uh, off in Asia and Africa and places like that that get hit. The thing they haven't been able to target is the financial institutions that are processing these transactions. And just based on the public information that we at Hudson are looking into, um, there's banks in London, there's banks in Switzerland, there's banks in Qatar, um, uh, there's banks in other countries that have been mentioned as well. Um, to the extent those financial institutions aren't put under pressure through uh, uh, things like the USA Patriot Act, um, you're going to always have somebody willing to launder the money in front for the regime uh, indirectly. So you're going to have to scare, we used to call it in the case of China, uh, kill the chicken to scare the monkeys. Uh, that's yep. we, and and we got, we're going to have to kill some chickens here to scare the monkeys in the financial system that are willing to work with Assad personally. I want to uh, I want to share an anecdote that you uh, uh, relayed to me, um, but I I I don't know uh, actually if um, if I can tell the whole story because it involves another individual. So I'll I'll tell it just kind of in in general terms, and then you can fill in the details if it's uh, uh, if it's um, appropriate. Um, I found it very interesting. You told me a story when you were working in the counter ISIS campaign and you were targeting the money of ISIS. Uh, there was an unknown question in the intelligence community about uh, uh, about money that was being held um, somewhere, uh, and you had the brilliant idea of calling them up and asking them if they had the money. Uh, are you are, are do you feel comfortable telling that story? Well, it's simple. I mean, we had um, for six months we'd had a request to the intelligence community and to state uh, overseas, uh, mostly our embassy in Baghdad. Tell us how much money uh, the Islamic State had sequestered inside the Mosul location of the Iraqi Central Bank. So the safest place to stick the money for the Islamic State was in the Central Bank vault mm -hmm. in the branch in Mosul. Not a surprise. I could never get, I mean, for six months, John Allen and I asked that almost every week and we got no response. So I said, you know, basically in my own parlance, screw it. I'm going to go out and just, I just called the deputy governor of the Iraqi Central Bank on Skype. And I said, uh, you know, I won't mention his name, but, you know, such and such. How much money's in the bank? He says, oh, I will find out as soon as quickly. I'll never forget that way he's great there. It's looking like right away. And he called uh, on his cell phone his guys because his own bank officials had been taken hostage by the Islamic State. And Mosul, they were running that facility. So they knew exactly how much money was there on any one day. And basically what it averaged every week and what would be the best day to strike it. Um, cause they sort of figured that was the idea. Uh, and, and they told us it was over a billion us dollars and a billion dollars, roughly in Iraqi dinars that had been stashed in there. Uh, about half of that was money that had been left from that when the U S was there. Um, we put a lot of cash into the Iraqi economy. The other half was money just taken by the Islamic state. The point is nobody in the intelligence community could tell us that we got a, uh, authoritative assessment, uh, from, uh, a senior official and, uh, within, um, a period of a month, uh, General McFarlane and his targeteers had developed a, a weapon, a, a bomb that was an incendiary 
and it bombed the central bank vault and burnt down. A bomb, a bomb designed to, to burn money. It, it was, <laughs> and it burned over a billion dollars at least and sent the Islamic State leadership into a tizzy. I love, I love that story because it shows that you don't always have to have a complex uh, nefarious CIA operation or an extremely expensive NSA surveillance operation. You just have to ask the right question and know who to ask. You know, you, if you just take the right guy out to lunch, you can find out what, uh, what, what needs to be done. Um, I think we'll start uh, wrapping it up here. Let me just first start by asking, is there anything that, that, uh, that any of you want to interject? And then I'll uh, but I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you an, each an opportunity to, to, um, uh, to make a closing remark. But is there anything that we should have been covering here that we haven't covered from your, your points of view? No, nothing? Okay, so Ambassador Jeffrey, do you have any uh, closing remarks? Sure. Uh, in 50 years of being involved in the uh, pointy end of uh, American uh, uh, security and diplomatic activities around the world, I've never seen a regime that poses more threats to its region and to the American idea of how the world should be organized in the Assad regime. We need to keep the pressure on. Uh, chemical weapons are a particularly uh, vicious and particularly terrible uh, example of what this regime does. As we've discussed today, there are others. Uh, we think it's particularly important to keep the focus on chemical weapons. We thank the IIT uh, team for their uh, uh, very bold and uh, very, very well documented uh, uh, proof that uh, the Assad regime, as it says at high levels, was responsible for this. We thank the OPCW and we thank the UN Security Council and the UN for supporting the OPCW. And let's get back to work. Thank you. Destinano? Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, I agree with everything Ambassador Jeffrey said. I said look, I know there's an audit, a lot of scrutiny around uh, international organizations right now. Uh, we spend a lot of money worldwide, but um, the, under the leadership of Director General Arias, the OPCW has done an incredible job of being impartial, um, of balancing uh, national interests, right? Of course, we have great interests, uh, but also understanding that all the signatories of the CWC have a seat at the table. And uh, 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 from my perspective, that is sort of quiet diplomacy, things that are lost on most people, even sophisticated people that are involved in Washington think tanks. Uh, but I think that's a great return on investment and a testament to the work that our del delegation does out there, as well as, well as uh, uh, the work that uh, Director General Arias does. This was a very bold, brave, and professional uh, effort, and uh, they deserve kudos. No, you know, I, I agree with you so much. I, I know from the time when I spent in government, things like this, because people who've been reading the newspaper have heard that, uh, um, that the Assad regime is doing this for so long, to have an international organization verify it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it allows the U.S. then to go take actions that it can't take just on the basis of its own intelligence and knowledge. So I really appreciate that too. Uh, David, any final words for us? Just that I um, want to applaud the administration. It really uh, came around. It had a, we had a tough moment uh, not that long ago, a couple of years ago or less. The president wanted to pull everything out. Uh, I think he was uh, persuaded by the ambassador and others that um, really, really quite small footprint uh, uh, with a determined effort uh, led by the State Department uh, uh, with support from the NSC could uh, turn the tide uh, against this regime. I think that tide is turning right now as we speak. It's one of the reasons why we wanted Mayor Hudson to have this event. Um, and uh, I, I, one last thing I want to say is uh, as a guy who worked extensively in support of the U.S. Special Operations Command, uh, I do feel very importantly uh, the, the contribution of our Joint Special Operations Task Force uh, on the ground and in the region. Uh, it's hard to give them credit, uh, but they're, they're out there. They're making a big effort, um, and I think they need to stay. Uh, that's just my own personal view. I think it would be a big loss if we were to pull back uh, uh, unnecessarily uh, an organization whose effectiveness is really quite high and, and, and whose cost is very low. We've lost almost no one in combat, uh, and we survived some significant onslaughts, including from the Russians, um, who learned uh, to not mess with SOCOM. So on that note, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming. I really appreciate it.